Right, I think we'll get started and people can just join over the next couple of minutes as they come in. So welcome everybody, or welcome back if you've been to a couple of these before. Um, we're really, really blessed tonight to be joined by Rebecca, who I first met a couple of years ago at um, the Walsingham Festival and we did a little bit of a women's session together. And the thing that struck me about Rebecca was that she was just so genuine and as like obviously just really grappled with all of this stuff we're going to talk about and um, has come to a point where she understands it, she's at peace with it and just wants to share it with other people um, to bring joy and freedom. So I think um, this is yeah just a really great opportunity for us tonight to hear from her so I'll let you introduce yourself Rebecca a bit more um but yeah so we're we going tonight all right thank you Jade um yeah I almost forget really where my introduction to U2000 came in my life it's been around for a while and has been just a blessing um for me in many many ways um I currently am living in the USA, which is a crazy day to be talking to you today. So please do pray for the USA and for the elections that are happening right now. Um, and I had been here since September, oh no, September, since January. So I got married in January. It's actually officially my 10 month anniversary day today. Um, very exciting, I know. And I'm celebrating it with all of you, very cool. Um, so it's actually only like one o'clock in the afternoon for me, but it's such a joy to, still be so in touch with the people in the UK. Um, so that's just been a great blessing for me. Um, as I'm sure like all of you this year has been, you know, a wild one full of adventures. So it's just fun, I think, to see what the Lord has been doing, um, even in the midst of like the chaos that this year has been. So um, yeah, I'm super excited to be here with everybody. Um, the session today, the title is officially Human Dignity. That's what we settled on because we've had a, a whole bunch, Jade and I, going backwards and forwards of what are we going to call this? And initially we were talking about theology of the body or sexuality or something along those lines. And what I feel like the Lord was really trying to speak to me was we can't talk about some of these things unless we have an understanding of who we are as a human being. Um, and recognize our human dignity and how to live in accordance with that dignity. And um, recognizing that all of these other like hot button topics feed into that. So I'm hoping to, um, as much as possible in the time that we've got, try and move on to some of those topics. Um, there's been a lot that's been going on, even just in my life and conversations that I've been having with people that I've been trying to wrestle with some of these questions. And I really do want to address those, but that we have to start with this foundation of a human dignity and what it is that the church is trying to teach us about who we are as a human being. So that's why we started there. Um, but also just to say, please do bear with me because this is a giant topic, right? And I've only got like 30 minutes or so that we're gonna try and cover a lot of things in. And um, one of the reasons I think that this topic is difficult is because it's so extremely personal. We're talking about identity and we're talking about people and their own stories. And it was really the heart of who they are, um, which is why that this is difficult. Um, so we're going to try and have some of these conversations today. And I'm gonna try and like help break open the framework that the church has for that. Um, but one, please do bear with me as I'm trying to explain it. And please do feel free. We'll have an opportunity at the end for question and answer. Thanks Jade for also saying that. Um, and I love, questions so please do um feel that but also just bear with me if I'm saying something that you're like oh my gosh I don't know how I feel it may be that I'm just exp expressing it weirdly or like just bear with me is what I'm gonna say so that being said I have some slides so let me just pull those up and you get to this is always a fun thing where you get to like see my home screen as we roll All these fun slides. Okay. Ta -da. Okay. I hope everyone can see. Firstly, we're going to start with you are a beautiful human being. So if you haven't been told today, 
by somebody that you look beautiful, even in like your COVID, you haven't bothered getting dressed up because no one's going to see you. Nurse, you you look beautiful today. Um, but I'm not very good at drawing human beings. So I've drawn a picture of a potato instead, but the potato is very beautiful in its own way too. So we're starting here because very easy question. How is a human being different from a potato? I was hoping I could have my chat open, but I might just need you to like call out some responses. How are human beings different from potatoes? Um, humans breathe. Great, we can breathe. Love that. We have feelings. We have feelings. It's okay to eat a potato, but it's not okay to eat a human. <laughs> Love that, cool. <laughs> Anymore. Humans can reason. We can reason, was that what you said? Yes. Yes. There are, I'm hoping that you know, some fundamental differences between human beings and potatoes. But this, I start here because this is an interesting philosophical thing. Um, we can talk about being made in the image and likeness of God. Um, we believe that from a faith point of view. Um, but what does that mean? Um, that we have an intellect and that we have a free will, um, that we have an ability to reason, that we have an ability to think about others, um, and that some of these attributes are unique to being human. Um, my dog, for example, cannot look at this lovely steak that I put down on the floor for him to eat and go, you know what, this other dog friend that I have down the street would prefer this more than I would. I'm going to give it to him. Right? Whereas actually as a human being, I have that ability, right? I can look at this good thing that I have in front of me that I really want and go, actually, I have a friend that might need it more than me. So there's an ability to be compassionate, I would say in different ways and an ability to um, reason. Um, so there's that. We have a body and a soul. Um, I think we can all agree that I am more than what you see, right? I have likes and dislikes there's food that I love and food that I hate and things that I love to do with my time and things that I'm afraid of and I have a backstory and memories and hopes and dreams um, and you can't see that on my exterior um, but I also can only tell you about those things through my body right be that my speaking be that my expressions be that my ability to write or draw or paint um, that there's a need for me as an interior being to be expressed in and through my physicality. Does that make sense? So that there's like this both and, so I'm not just the interior, but my interior is expressed through my exterior. And that's also really important because the church understands the need for matter and the need for tangibility and things like that. Um, so I, um, I'm made with an intellect and a free will. So I have this capacity for an inner life. Um, I have a capacity to choose. Um, I have a body and a soul. I'm an interior and an exterior thing. And I'm also a someone and not a something, right? This is why it's okay to eat potatoes and not to eat humans, right? That actually as a human being, I shouldn't be used as an end in myself. What does that mean? That it's okay for me to like throw my cup on the floor and the cup's not gonna be upset with me, right? Whereas actually throw a human being on the floor and they might get upset with you. So there's a, a need to recognize that there is a, dis a value that is placed on humans that is above all of these other things. Now you would say the same in some ways of like, there's a hierarchy of goods, okay? So like a rock probably being at the bottom, it's got no feelings. It doesn't really matter if you throw it. Um, to like animal or plants. And then you've kind of got animals, which we shouldn't be hurting, but they don't have quite the same dignity as a human being. Um, and that's partly because of our intellect and our capacity to choose and our free will. And that comes from being made in the image and likeness of God. So in the beginning, God created humanity and we were made good. And we were made male and female. That through this complementarity of male and female, 
there was a harmony that was spoken. Um, there is this wholeness between us. So we were made in the image and likeness of God. This is what the church teaches us. And that therefore we are made, if God is love, we are made by love, for love and in the image of love. Um, that there is a communion that is made that we speak about in our humanity. We were made to be fruitful. Um, we were made to see and know God. We were made um, not to be selfish. Um, and in the beginning, there were no disordered desires. However, what happened? I'm sure you all know the answer to this. Dun, dun, dun. We sinned. Um, and the thing that I think I find really fascinating in, this par in the, the story of Eden is that the snake tempts Eve by asking that question of, are you sure? Are you sure that God really wants what is good for you? Are you sure that he isn't holding back? Are you sure that he knows what it, you want? and what is good for you and that he wants your fullness or is he just trying to keep you trapped um and i think many of us can relate i think to those doubts of those questions right um and that this seed of doubt which is why i love that it sort of forms this question mark on the image this seed of doubt caused us to grasp instead of trust to take rather than receive um now the impact of the fall was that our, not everything was lost. We're not now bad humans. It's not like we were made good and now we are bad, but that our intellect was darkened and that our will was weakened. So our intellect being our ability to know the good, the difference between right and wrong and good and bad is weakened. So we don't always know what is good and what is bad in the same way that we did. And our will is weakened, which means that even when we know the good, choosing it is hard, right? And I relate to it as this shattered worldview, okay? So if you were to imagine looking in this mirror and it's reflecting back at you something that is true, but also something that is distorted, like it's a both and. Because we're trying to look at this world and seeing it slightly refracted, that the original image and plan of God is now slightly changed. And this is what we mean by like our disordered intellect. Um, that I look at something and I don't see how it aligns in the same way that God would have necessarily planned it or thought that it would. So we have this shattered worldview um, and it leads to a lot of confusion. Um, it leads to a lot of doubt. It leads to a lot of just complication, um, both in my interior self of questions like, um, am I a good person? What is it that I want to do in my life with my life? What is the purpose of my life? How am I like living fully alive? Those sorts of questions come as a result of like this distortion. Those questions of like, can God be trusted? Does God even exist? Does he love me? I don't know where he is in my life. All of those sorts of things are examples of what was never supposed to be the plan of God, but is because of that, that seed of doubt that was sown. Praise God, however, he didn't leave us in that mess right and um, and i think if nothing else from this talk today i want to like focus in on this point jesus christ took on human flesh and died on a cross so that we could be redeemed and there is so much for us in this understanding that i think we still have to permeate and continue to build into he entered in, he took on our broken humanity and he redeemed it. By taking on our human flesh, he made our humanity more than it ever could have been before. And that this is not a backwards journey, but a forwards one. So we're not to return to Eden, which was what our history was, but that we're now granted this new life in heaven. There's a mystery here. We don't fully understand it, but it's something for us to continually learn to like dive into. And this is just a beautiful image that I found for what redemption could look like. Um, it's this Japanese art of repairing things with gold, um, to repair pottery with gold or silver lacquer and understanding that the piece is now more beautiful for having been broken. Um, Audrey Assad is a singer who had this song called Fortunate Fall. 
um, O happy fault that gained for us so great a redeemer. Um, and this recognition within the church that although the fall was bad, um, it has granted us Jesus Christ. And that life of redemption that he has won for us is even greater than we could have had in Eden. So whenever you are sat feeling like I am too broken of a human being, this is what I want you to think about. Because actually through grace and through the life that God is calling us to, there is beauty to be found in that midst of brokenness. That it is not a case of, well, look, everything's fallen apart. We made this sin right at the beginning of time and thanks Eve, but like recognizing that God through the cross has brought us to this whole new level and fullness of humanity. Um, so our brokenness won't necessarily disappear but in a way that it becomes our beauty, okay? That these bruises and wounds will speak not of death, but of love that has overcome. St. Augustine has this quote that I think just really sums it up. And it's, in my deepest wound, I saw your glory and it dazzled me. There is beauty to be found. And I think we need to try and keep these three images in line as we go through the rest of our talk. Um, because this is really the world that we live in. There is this shattered worldview where I don't fully make sense of this world in front of me. And we're gonna talk about that. There is the reality of Jesus Christ coming and taking our, our brokenness on the cross and redeeming it and bringing it to new life. Um, and we live in this really weird in between. Like if we could put like a little like image between the cross and like the repaired with gold pottery, we live straddling these two. We live in this broken humanity where the world doesn't fully make sense, but we also live in the fact that Jesus Christ has come and redeemed it. And there's a both ands, right? We talk about the mass being a place of heaven on earth um, because we can experience some of that, that redemption and some of that life in heaven already now. That is a life of grace. Jesus Christ is present and true in our lives and that there is a fullness to be found in and through him because of that but we also experience brokenness and things don't fully make sense. And I still struggle with sin and I still struggle with my brokenness and betrayal and hurt, right? So we're, we're in this in between um, and that's just the reality of where we are. So if nothing else from today's talk, I want you to take this image to prayer and just sort of see what the Lord will speak to you in that. But I did say that we would try and um, move on to some practicals. So um, first thing I want to talk about is how do we live this life fully alive? Um, the church calls us to a fullness, right? The church desires for us our flourishing because God desires for us our flourishing. This is gained through um, the word that the church uses is maturity um, and need to grow. Primarily, this relates to um, the fact that if our intellect is darkened and our will is weakened, um, we need to improve our intellect. Um, so what does that mean? That means learning and reading and asking questions and wrestling with these things. Um, how do I continue to grow in maturity rather than just staying where I am and saying, well, this is what I see of the world. It's encouraging us to engage in that conversation, which is why events like this hopefully will be helpful. Um, so maturity also requires of us um, an understanding of needing to put right things first. Um, primarily that God needs to come first in our life and our relationship with God needs to be the primary thing in our lives. And that when we have that in place, everything else hopefully will start to fall into place. But that our brokenness and our shattered worldview can result in a disorderedness in our life. That means that we put other things first in our orders, right? Disorder, a change of order. Um, now we can call these idols, right? The church calls these idols and we can make them of work, of marriage, of sex, money, pride, 
false humility, our phones, social media. All of us in the whole world will have these struggles of trying to remember and practice putting things in right order. Um, so part of this is um, learning to grow, learning to ask questions, recognizing um, our weakened intellect, the fact that I need to learn to continue to grow and having the humility of that to engage in those conversations. Um, and then it's also about embracing the reality that sometimes we don't always get the answers that we want. Um, and this is not an easy thing to hear or acknowledge, but suffering is inevitable for all of us in our lives. We all have to go through suffering and struggle and adversity. And I think this is important to say like, holiness does not make you exempt. It does not ma mean that the more holy you are, the less suffering you have in your life. Jesus suffered, right? On a cross, yes, but even in his ministry, his ministry life was hard. So let's be clear, to be holy does not reduce our suffering. Um, and I think that sometimes it can be sold to us like that. Well, let's just pray and everything will be fine, which is true to a point. And it's true because God's grace is enough, but not that the feelings of suffering necessarily go away and that there's a difference in that. By trusting in God does not mean that I am no longer ever going to suffer anything and I'm not going to find anything hard. And I think that's an important distinction to make. What it does mean is that faith can help us to embrace suffering in a way that it doesn't necessarily crush us. And that that's the difference. We must always place suffering and struggle alongside hope. This is what the church teaches, that the virtue of hope responds to the aspiration to happiness, which God places in the heart of every man. It takes up the hopes that inspire men's activities and purifies them so as to order them to the kingdom of heaven. Hope keeps man from discouragement and it sustains him in times of abandonment and it opens up his heart in, accept, in expectation of the eternal beatitude, which is happiness. So I want to say that everything that we're talking about comes back to the church's desire for our fullness and for our happiness. And it might seem odd that we're talking about happiness in terms of struggle and suffering, um, but that there is an oxymoron and that there's an important mesh that is found here. Um, and I think for me, this is really where the rubber meets the road. This is the grittiness of, of life in general, and in particular, the Christian life, um, because we have to somehow reconcile our suffering with what, who we know of God and our desires for our own life. Um, Christ calls each of us into a type of suffering that brings joy even in the midst of loss and it, it is, is a paradoxical burden um, that makes somehow makes our journey easier and not harder a mysterious way of enjoying our cake by giving it up and it's a way to live our life by losing it and we find this throughout the scriptures to lay down our life is a way of loving people and to lay down our life is a way of gaining it um, and we see that mostly in the cross, um, but I'm sure you can probably imagine examples in your life where you've seen that too. So to not lose sight of hope and to continue on our practical, well, where do we go from here? The purpose of our lives is to love well. And the purpose of your life is to learn to be gift and to be gift to other people to use our life and our skills and even those things that we don't feel very good at um, to love others. And that it doesn't matter how small those things are. Um, saint Therese of Lisieux is really the, the saint that speaks a lot to that, right? That it is our small acts of love, be that kicking a needle up off at the floor or speaking to that nun in the convent that she didn't like very much or doing the jobs that she didn't like but other people thought that she did or allowing yourself to be misunderstood for her she's full of practical examples so if you want something to read like saint therese is a really fascinating saint to get to know but interestingly and this has been partly i think my year of being in quarantine um just reading some more of the lives of the saints how many of them 
say that to be true. But rarely is it the big decisions that canonize us as much as it is all of the little ones. And if it is the big ones, it's because the little ones have led up to the big ones. So let's just recognize that there is no such thing as too small of an act of kindness. Even if it's not noticed, you make a huge difference. So our purpose in life is not this mystery for us to figure out. And I think sometimes we sort of talk about that. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. Um, I don't know what the purpose of my life is or what God is calling me to. And whilst you may not know the practicals, we do know that you are called to be gift and that that's actually just a great place to start. Um, Pope John Paul, Pope John Paul, Pope Paul the Sick has this famous quote, man cannot fully find himself except through sincere gift of himself. So unless I learn to serve others around me and make a gift of my life, I'm forever going to question who I am and who God is. And that it is through being a gift of myself that I come to know more of who I am and who God is. However, that takes practice, much like learning an instrument or a sport. We don't necessarily go straight on the field one day and we're suddenly amazing at hockey, at hockey right? Or like whatever it needs to be. Um, I don't sit down at a piano and suddenly can play it super well. It takes time and effort and learning through mistakes. Um, so don't be afraid. And this is partly where maturity comes in. The pursuit of virtue requires patience um, and it requires a consistency in learning to grow. We can talk a lot about the, uh, the virtue of chastity here too. So chastity is the virtue named by the church as loving in right order. So when I said right at the beginning that our disordered desires caused by that shattered worldview need reordering so that we can put things in the right order. Um, chastity is the virtue that helps us to do that because it teaches us how to love well. Um, Chastity is quick to affirm the value of the human person in every situation. And it recognizes the value of the dignity of the human person and it defends it. Chastity is a long-term and difficult method, which means that it is not something that you start today and you can do perfectly, um, but something that requires continual practice and continual growth. Um, however, it is the sure way to happiness. Um, that this is really the only way that we, this is really what the church says is our way to happiness is through practicing virtue and in particular practicing chastity. Um, yeah, sorry, I was like, is there anything else I wanted to say on that? There's a lot that we can talk about in terms of the pursuit of virtue and the desire that it is to, to reach our fullness, right? Practice, growth, maturity is really at the heart of all of these things. The other half of that on the side of practicing, um, yes, there is a need to grow in virtue, but there's also a need to grow in virtue surrounded by people. There is an importance of community and community because we are made for communion. If we're made in the image and likeness of God and God is a communion in itself, we're made to practice being gift to each other right? And in particular in friendship, um, but also our family, right? We're born into a family and we're born into um, a communion. Now, this obviously has different connotations in the world of 2020 when we're all having to do things over Skype. Um, communion and community looks very different today than it would have a year ago. And um, that's hard because the church will also talk about the importance of tangibility. It is important for us to sit and share meals with people. Um, it is important for us to see people face to face and to acknowledge their human dignity. Um, and that's hard. And that's why all of us, I think, are, are struggling in this season of like, I can't necessarily just do that. And I just wanted to say that I am well practiced in the world of Zoom and FaceTime. So I am now living in America because I married an American. So for two years, we dated online. We would see each other in person, but there was also a seeing each other online. So the, the Zoom fatigue that you're probably all feeling, I well understand. And the frustration of bad connection lines. 
And I think in many ways, it's also blessed us in our marriage. Um, one, because I think we value this time that we're now stuck in the same house together. Of like, man, isn't it so exciting being in the same room? And let's recognize the joy that sometimes comes as a result of that. But there's also been a joy of having to like learn patience and learn communication and learn um, intentionality. And that's really, I think, what community can do for us, that it can help us um, learn to be gifted in a different way. So although it's not the same in the life of COVID, you can still form good community. And that's just my encouragement, I think, to you. Um, friendship is important. Um, even um, from the days of Aristotle, we've talked about the importance of friendship being humanity's greatest gift, that we need friends who will help hold us accountable and help lead us towards the fullness of who we were made to be. Um, and we can only really live a fullness and we can only really live happiness according to the church when we also live in communion with others. Um, be that over food, be that through mass, be that over Zoom, um, however that looks. So if you want a practical takeaway from today, um, Having people over for meals when you can, spending time with your family is important. Um, call those friends who may need you to check in on them, write a letter. Um, try and be intentional about building up your community. Um, also the need for sacraments. Um, the church in particular will say that the need for the practical things so there's a joy of being able to physically go and hear, have your confession heard, right? Because there's a practical thing that happens there. And the same with adoration, um, that there's a, a practical being in the same room physically as Jesus, right? That there's something important about that. Again, quarantine is throwing some of those things off. And that's not to say that we're now without God because God is beyond all of these things right and where struggles abound grace abounds all the more so I think like let's recognize that as we enter into this struggle of feeling separated potentially from the church um in this midst of close like the, the new lockdown that's coming um recognize that God will be giving you graces to get through it but also recognize that when we come out of this, that's an important place for us to be, to spend our time in the sacraments and to recognize that all of those graces that come through from us. And that really the Lord is the only one who is the one who will satisfy our hearts. And the more time we spend in prayer, the more time we come before him in that recognition of my own brokenness, the recognition of my own hurt, the recognition of my own longings and my desires, the more he can continue to repair that brokenness with gold and bring beauty and life in places that are currently not beautiful or life-giving. Um, so we're kind of, again, in this weird like in-between, right? Of like, this is something that's so important and I would be amiss to not say it. Um, that this is where the satisfaction of all of our, our hearts and our longings will be found, um, but that we're just in a weird season of life right now. Okay, I have a few more minutes where I'm just gonna try and cover some of these topics as briefly slash as well as I possibly can. That's like my fundamental, we have the gospel worldview of like, what is it that the church is trying to say and why? some practical things of like, what does that mean for you and your humanity to live this out well? And that can apply to all things, but I'm just gonna specifically home in on some things. Particularly, um, Pope Francis recently came out with some comments that caused a lot of controversy uh, around homosexuality. Um, now, primarily really what he said was now just as a disclaimer I have not read everything that there is to read about this okay so there might be something that I'm missing please just bear with me on that but my understanding is that what he said was that he was recorded in an interview saying that gay people have a right to a family and that he expressed support for civil unions none of that is strictly contrary to what the church has already laid out as a foundation I know that people have been upset because it's caused a lot of confusion and that there's been questions of like, well, what does that mean? 
and primarily what I have come to understand um, and what generally I have sort of tried to um, in my conversations with people where this is um, just struggle, right? Um, the reality is all human persons have dignity, right? So to be someone who is gay does not mean that you lose your human dignity. Fundamental, doesn't change. We all have a right to a family, in particular, the family into which you are born, right? So the Pope explicitly states that to be gay is to not be kicked out of your family, right? And also that our church family doesn't like to be gay does not necessarily automatically kick you out of that. And that we should have legal laws that surround and protect those who are gay. That's primarily as far as I'm aware that the church, that the Pope was trying to say in those comments. So it doesn't necessarily change anything in particular. Um, the church does have this recognition of like the human person has a fundamental identity as this child of God. Um, and that to be defined by someone as someone who is defined by their sexuality is to reduce them as a human person from the fullness that they are. So we should as much as possible talk about human persons versus how we're sexually attracted. OK. Um, however, the church will also speak to and defend the dignity of marriage. And the church will only recognize marriage between man and woman, life-giving union. So the arguments against homosexuality are also the same arguments against contraception and against sex outside of marriage, okay? And a whole host of these other things. So I'm going to um, briefly read um, it's a it's on the Vatican website um, and it's something to do with like the pastoral care of homosexual persons um, that came out a number of years ago it was when Pope Benedict was still a cardinal so it is a little bit older but as far as I'm aware it's the most official up-to-date document that they have um, and I think it's just yeah hopefully helpful to understand why the church teaches what she teaches, but also how it doesn't necessarily change. Um, yeah, I'll explain that at the end. Okay, let me see. The church teaches and celebrates the divine plan of the loving and life-giving union of men and women in the sacrament of marriage. The church teaches that sex is only for marriage and that marriage can only be between a man and a woman. To have sex with someone who is of the same sex annuls the rich symbolism and meaning, not to mention the goals of God's creative design. Homosexuality is not a complementary, complementary union and it is unable to, to transmit life, so thwarts and obstructs the call of life on self-giving love. This does not mean that homosexual persons are not often generous and giving of themselves, but that when they engage in activity, they confirm within themselves a disordered sexual inclination which is essentially self-indulgent. As in every moral disorder, homosexual activity prevents one's full own fulfillment and happiness by acting contrary to the creative wisdom of God. The church in her teaching does not limit, but rather defends personal freedom and the dignity realistically and authentically understood. So let me just rephrase that briefly with contraception, okay? The church teaches and celebrates the plan of life, loving and life-giving union of men and women in the sacraments of marriage, teaches that sex is only for marriage and that marriage can only be between a man and a woman. To have sex which um, using contraception annuls the rich symbolism and meaning, not to mention the goals of God's creative design. Contraceptive sex is not a complementary union and it is unable to transmit life, so thus thwarts and obstructs the call of life to a self-giving love. This does not mean that people who use contraception are also not often not generous and giving of themselves, but that when they engage in this activity, they confirm within themselves a disordered sexual inclination, which is essentially self-indulgent. As with every moral disorder, contraceptive use prevents one's own fulfillment and happiness by acting contrary to the creative wisdom of God. The church and her teaching does not limit, but rather defends personal freedom and dignity realistically and authentically understood. And the reason I wanted to do the both, the repeat there, is to recognize that the church is asking for our fullness and our flourishing. 
And every way in which we do not do that, the church is going to try as much as possible to correct that behavior. And um, that does not mean that these conversations are easy, okay? Um, and that there needs to be this balance found in our pastoral care, okay? When I'm having that conversation with somebody that I love who is experiencing same-sex um, attraction, I'm not necessarily gonna be reading them this document. Okay, and I think that's important to understand. Um, but I need to remind them of their own dignity and that I see that um, and that I desire to hear them in their story. That needs to be our fundamental starting place. But it's also helpful for me to understand and reorder my own intellect so that I can be more present, hopefully, to the person in front of me. And at what point you say something and at what point you have these conversations, there isn't necessarily a right or wrong, I would argue, um, way of doing that. Um, I'm just gonna do one more quickly and then we're gonna wrap up. And I wanted to talk about gender identity briefly. Again, this is not a straightforward topic. Um, so just to briefly try and recap, um, one of the difficulties that we have right now is one, because the, the narrative is still relatively new in terms of our society, and also that the, there's multiple aspects within gender identity and gender dysphoria. There is on the one hand, those that experience um, being the opposite gender. So they agree that gender exists, but I feel like the other one, or on the other end of that spectrum, I don't believe in this thing called gender and we can be or whatever. Um, there's kind of this ends of the spectrum and in some ways that adds in some ways to the difficulty of having a dialogue because um, it makes things less straightforward because how you might approach them might be different. Primarily, the recognition that one, we are body and soul and therefore my body matters and because it is an expression of my soul, right? But that we can't separate the two. You are not just your body and you are not just your soul, but that we're a combination of the two. Two, God doesn't make mistakes. And there is nothing about who you are that is a mistake. There is, that is not to undermine or ignore the very real experiences that people might have with gender dysphoria. We understand that this might be a very difficult personal thing. And that's not to undermine their experiences but more a recognition of, I need to try and tell you the importance of who you are as a human being and that you were not a mistake and that you were not made as a mistake. The church is very clear that we should not harm our healthy bodies um, as much as possible. Again, that's why um, contraception is an issue. You're trying to take something that works and functions really well and make it not work and function well. Um, and that there's a problem and a disorderedness in that. Um, and one that I feel very particularly important about um, is that I think we need to really redeem as a church what we mean by masculine and feminine. Um, and I was thinking about this the other day um, of like often I feel like particularly as a woman that Mary is this very meek, humble, beautiful figure of like someone who never did anything wrong. And she's not in some ways someone who's easy I think to aspire to as a woman who also wants to be like powerful, I guess powerful, and like strong. Um, and I think that the word that came to me in my prayer was that to be powerful is not necessarily the same as being loud. And that Mary is really important example of what power looks like in the silence of our yeses, that there's an interiority of choosing what is right and defending what is right without needing to yell. And I think that's just an important recognition to say at the beginning of that. And I also think that it's important to recognize that there is a great beauty in our communion of saints right? Like, let's look at all the feminine saints that have ever existed in the humanity of time. They're all different. And we have Joan of Arc, who went to war and was a soldier. We have Therese of Lisieux, who was on the outside, at least, very demure and quiet and lived the life of a cloistered nun. We have St. Catherine of Siena, 
who wrote to tell the Pope that he was being out of line and he needed to get back to Rome. And we have like within the realm of our femininity, there is scope for all of us, right? There is a scope for what this looks like fully alive whilst recognizing the individuality of you as a human person. And this is the same for the masculine, but I'm a woman and I've spent more time thinking about femininity than I have about masculinity. So not to like discredit, but that I think we need to move away from these like gender roles of like, well, to do this is to be feminine and to do this is to be masculine as much as we need to bring that to the fore of like, actually, what does it mean to be masculine and feminine? And there's a lot that we can unpack in that. And I'm going to round up because we don't have a lot of time. So final slide is just to say that we are called to the heights, right? That we are called to this fullness of where we are. Is it possible to live a life of happiness without God? Yes, actually, I do think that it probably is. That might be a little bit controversial, but I want you to think of all of those people that you know that are not practicing Christians. Are they living a life that is happy? Potentially, yes. Um, but they're not necessarily living the fullness of the flourishing that God has ordered for them. And I think this is the difference. Where on this mountain are you going to stop? Because we could settle at this really awesome base camp, right? If we imagine like the closer we are up this mountain of happiness, we get closer to the Lord. By putting forth effort and by putting forth struggle time to grow growth and maturity we're hopefully moving further and further up this mountain and closer to who the lord closer to the lord and therefore the closer to who we are because we find ourselves in him and this is for all of us right like just because i am a married person and i'm married to another christian doesn't mean that i'm also living a life of virtue that it takes practice right um so I think that's just been a helpful image to me. Like one, a check on myself, where have I stopped on this mountain? Am I also pitching tent and being like, cool, where I am is great. And I'm just going to live this life of like coasting by a little bit. Or am I going to allow myself to continue on the journey and continue to the heights of what God has in store for us? Um, there is more to be discovered and God wants our fullness. And he is not about us settling for mediocrity. Um, and that we shouldn't be okay with settling for mediocrity either. Um, my final quote, man must reconcile himself to his natural greatness. I'm gonna leave it there. Thanks so much, Rebecca. There was, I wrote a lot of notes down there on my phone. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we've just got a couple of minutes if anybody does have any questions um, that they want to ask Rebecca while she's here. Mission team, we will meet after, but if anybody wanted to ask now in this group, then you're welcome to. Okay, maybe people will have questions they can talk about in small groups after as well. Um, if anybody does think of anything, feel free to email us and we'll get a response back to you somehow <laughs> um but yeah thank you all so much for coming thanks especially to Rebecca and if you're in mission team we'll join on the other call now if you want to stay around for small groups and if not we'll see you in two weeks so this 17th um father David Donahue um, who used to be a mental health nurse before he was a priest and his sister who is a psychotherapist are going to join us um, to talk about mental health so I think that's going to be a really interesting one especially in the in lockdown 2.0 um, so yeah we'll see you in two weeks if not on alpha or in five minutes okay see you